Welcome to our video history project. Today we're very fortunate to have past president Dr. Michael Minuti to talk to us today and tell us a little bit about his history. Mike, thank you for coming. Thank you for being president of the college and all that you have done. Well, you're very welcome, and it's my pleasure to be here to have this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, myself, I guess, but also about the college and what it has meant to me. Well, let's begin. Mm -hmm. Where were you born, and where did you grow up? I was uh, born and grew up in Trenton, New Jersey, the capital of New Jersey, uh, an area that's now very economically uh, depressed. But in uh, my early childhood, it was a uh, still a manufacturing town, and it had a large Italian-American population that was uh, centered in an area that I uh, grew up in on the periphery of that area. And when did you first decide you wanted to become a physician? I, I really um, did not have aspirations to be a physician until I was in college and started to think about various uh, options in terms of career choices. My family, family that I, I was the first person in my immediate family to go to college and my parents, although they were very educationally oriented in terms of that being important um, in, in order to uh, achieve more and to enjoy life more, um, they, they were not educated themselves and so I didn't have a lot of guidance. I had, my father had a cousin who had become a physician and I knew him, um, but uh, that didn't influence me a great deal. I think I was more influenced by uh, the friends that I made during college uh, and my uh, interest in biology in college uh, to go on to medicine. What college did you go to? I went to Georgetown University in Washington, and I actually uh, stayed there uh, for nine years. I went to college, and then I uh, followed that with medical school at Georgetown, and I stayed at Georgetown for my internship. So, as, as you can s assume, or surmise, um, uh, I, I felt more like a Washingtonian than a Trentonian. I left Trenton when I was uh, 17 years old and uh, Washington really became my home during my most formative years, I think. When did you decide that you wanted to become an OBGYN? Actually, I decided during my internship. I, those were the days, of course, when people did a separate internship from residency and often in a different field. And I thought I wanted to do internal medicine and I did a medical internship at Georgetown. And very shortly into my internship, I decided that I did not want to do my further training in medicine and I uh, decided on OBGYN. And where did you go for that training? I came to uh, Philadelphia, uh, to the University of Pennsylvania, uh, through a so somewhat accidental circumstances, and, um, and I wound up staying there for the rest of my career, essentially, except for a two-year stint in the military. Uh, uh, I did my uh, initial training in OBGYN and then I did a first year of maternal fetal medicine fellowship at Penn and I went into the military to serve two years at Fort Lewis, uh, Washington and returned to Penn to finish my fellowship. Uh, and uh, so I did my second year of fellowship when I returned and then I went on to a genetics fellowship and the rest is sort of history. I've been there ever since. Who was the chairman of the department and head of your training program? Uh, Luigi Mastriani was the chairman of the department. And uh, at the time, I was a medical intern. We were working 36 on and 12 off, and I had to go out looking for residencies. And so I initially decided that I would focus on residencies that were within a day travel that I could go to see. And I went to uh, Yale to interview. and. Uh, that I, and I went to Penn to interview. I went to Penn first, and Luigi was very, uh, a, a very charming man, as you probably know, and um, he uh, spent almost the whole day with me. He took me around, showed me all of the things that were happening. He was a new, young chairman in a department. He was very enthusiastic and excited. 
Uh, and I went the next day to Yale and was interviewed there by a senior oncologist who was quite elderly, uh, who, was, who had been on vacation. This was during the summer months, and he came in to interview me. And uh, it was a totally different uh, experience from having Luigi and his enthusiasm. And, um, and I decided then that I would go to Penn. Uh, I had intended to look at the University of Colorado, uh, but uh, the Barry Plan deferments came out and Luigi called me and said, I need a commitment right away. I have several people on the hook and I would really love for you to come. And I said, okay, I'll come. I can imagine a better mentor than Luigi. <laughs> right, he <laughs> was great. Actually, I had two, two additional mentors who were really wonderful. Uh, Dick Schwartz was, uh, Richard Schwartz was my uh, mentor in obstetrics and really influenced me to go into maternal fetal medicine and I did my fellowship with him both before and after the military uh, and uh, joined his practice. And he was also the person who involved me uh, with uh, ACOG. That was one of my next questions yeah. was when would you get involved with ACOG? So early on in my career on the faculty when I finished fellowship I joined the faculty and early on Dick uh, was then the uh, secretary of district three and was obviously headed toward leadership positions in ACOG and he encouraged me to come to a district meeting and from there the, ne the following year I was invited to present uh, to do a presentation at a district meeting and they asked me if I would consider uh, becoming uh, assistant secretary of district three who had never it was an office that did not exist that they were creating and they wanted because they wanted to bring young younger people onto their executive board and so I agreed to do that and I did that for seven years actually <laughs> that was a, must have been interesting as a uh, young uh, fellow and a young person in the college yeah it was a great experience, uh, the camaraderie, the learning experiences, uh, both professionally and personally were great, and um, I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, Jim Breen passed through uh, as the president uh, at, at, during those years, and um, Dick actually left the University of Pennsylvania and tried to recruit me to go with him to New York, but we my wife and I and our young children were sort of settled in Philadelphia and I was happy uh, and so I did not go to New York and Dick went on to become the president while he was in in New York. Um, I had another mentor who was very critically important to me, a, a man named uh, Bill Melman who was a pediatrician geneticist and he um, convinced the dean of the medical school that they should have a department of genetics and he was a very forward-looking uh, person. He understood that genetics wasn't limited just to pediatrics and would eventually uh, involve every specialty of medicine. So he had as a goal to identify someone to train and mentor in every specialty area in the medical school. And because of my work with Dick, on early amnio on amniocent the early studies of amniocentesis, uh, he uh, took me under his wing. And I then went on to do a genetics fellowship uh, through his program. And, um, and he was uh, a very important mentor to, to get me involved in uh, genetics. And then he uh, gave me a joint appointment in genetics and uh, unfortunately died at a pretty young age. And uh, it was a great loss to those of us who he had uh, taken under his wing. He had an internist, he found a surgeon, he found a neurologist, and a dermatologist, an ophthalmologist. All of those people are still in genetics. And, and of course, genetics was so important in OBGYN because we're the specialty where genes are transmitted. I had a very sort of key role for him. I would suspect you were probably one of the very first of our specialty that actually got into genetics. Well, there were a few people. Joe Lee Simpson was about the same, I don't know if he was exactly the same vintage as I was in terms of residency, but he, he was involved uh, in those early years in genetics. I remember him visiting uh, 
Bill and the, and the Penn program. Uh, and um, there were just a couple of other people. I remember that when uh, Creon came out with their first book on uh, genetics, it was, uh, what, about 40 pages or something like that? And right. Very, very simple. Yeah. Basically, it was meiosis and mitosis. <laughs> that was about it. Yeah. In fact, John Makuda, always, who was another one of my professors and mentors, always used to kid me about how when he was in medical school, they taught him that there were 48 chromosomes in, the, in all of our cells, and he wanted to know where the other two went. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it, uh, and of course, has been a very important part of my academic life and my clinical practice. Uh, genetics has in my, uh, uh, my laboratory work. Uh, and uh, and all of that I owe really to Dick and Bill sort of bringing all of this together for me. Well, tell us a little bit about that early practice. What kind of patients were you seeing since this was a relatively new concept? Well, Dick and I were seeing uh, high-risk obstetrical patients and in those days um, a, a lot of them uh, had RH sensitization. It was an area of interest of Dick's and uh, diabetes, of course, and uh, hypertension and the usual things that one might see in a high-risk practice. I still work in, in a high-risk practice at Penn and now uh, the patients have uh, uh, malignancies that are being treated, uh, they have corrected congenital heart defects and the like, and these were things that we didn't really see because uh, those patients didn't become pregnant in, in that era. Uh, so that high-risk practice has really evolved very, very substantially. In terms of genetics, I was seeing mostly uh, women who were over 35 for amniocentesis. CVS didn't exist. Uh, molecular uh, studies didn't exist. I remember asking Bill if there was anything linked to the sickle cell gene because we understood sickle cell disease at a level of mutation. And, uh, I said, is there anything linked to this that we could use? And he said, no, there's no way to sort of figure that out at this point. Uh, and of course, that was only within a few years later that uh, there were uh, linkages, uh, molecular linkages described to sickle cell disease. And of course, the whole field has advanced to now we're sequencing people's uh, genome. How would you compare when you first started your practice with how your practice today is in terms of dealing with the patient? Well, my practice is, uh, I'm on the downhill slide of my career so that I don't work in the primary part of the OB practice. I do consultations, I do ultrasound, and I do genetic uh, counseling and consultations. Uh, and so it's uh, quite different, but throughout my career, I don't think my personal interaction really changed appreciably. I still, I feel uh, the pressures of all of the changes that have occurred in medicine in terms of uh, measuring your uh, productivity and your output and that kind of thing. When I do ultrasound sessions, I, um, I may sign off on 25 patients in an afternoon. That would have been unheard of in my early days. Uh, of practice. Well, or ultrasound would have been hurt. I not heard of, but, <laughs> but, but uh, the, the volume would have been unheard of in terms of those co uh, more extensive services, I think. I mean, certainly seeing routine prenatal visits, a large volume was always uh, the case, but um, I think that uh, medicine, the practice of medicine has changed really appreciably, but the the, the work that I do has really sort of evolved with the science. Would you say that the whole field of genetic counseling and actually this actually looking at genetics as an integral part of an OBGYN practice has changed significantly the way we as obstetricians practice? Oh, I think it has enormously because genetics was really where um, I think the obstetricians had their first encounter with uh, screening, also had their first encounter with uh, counseling where patients would choose options or not uh, in terms of uh, whether to have testing and, and, uh, and that type of thing. And so I think non-directive counseling, um, as you know, in, in many years ago when I was first in the specialty, when you were uh, in, in the specialty, uh, 
our advice to patients was very directive, I think. And uh, genetics taught me to be non-directive in my counseling. And I think as it infiltrated obstetrics, it taught every, everyone how to be non-directive. Uh, obviously, there are times when we have to uh, make a decision about what's best for the patient and make a recommendation, but many, many things in obstetrics, like contraception, uh, continuing pregnancies or not, and that type of thing, have to be non-directive. They're individual choices that the patient makes. Let's go back. After you talk about your role in ACOG and your experience mm -hmm. with ACOG, you first came in at a very young level. Yeah. How did you uh, move from that to the ACOG system? Well, I, um, I originally I was very busy career-wise and with my family, and so it was it satisfied me to sit still in this assistant secretary position for a while. And um, as it turned out, I came in sort of off cycle, so I did a year, and then I did a full term, and then they said they they would be happy to to propose me for another full term and I said fine and so I did that and um, and then I started to move up the district ladder but along the way as, as you know I also um, ACOG decided that they needed a subcommittee on genetics uh, for uh, the Com committee on obstetrical practice because there was so much starting to happen in genetics which impacted OB practice. And so I was appointed the, to that committee. And actually, I was the person who lobbied ACOG to, uh, one of the people at least, who lobbied ACOG to, that we really needed a, a full committee on genetics. And eventually, I was on that committee. I, I, I chaired OB practice. And, and so I moved through a series of committees. And um, contrary to what current practices where people, the number of committees that people can serve on simultaneously is limited. I was uh, being appointed to a whole bunch of different things by different people uh, as I was moving up also the ranks of the district that I was district chair and eventually of course I became a national officer uh, and um, at that point I wasn't serving so much on committees anymore. Well, let's take you back to as a national officer. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little about your experience as being the president of the American College. What do you remember the most about that? I think I, I, the, what I remember most was um, the people that I met during those years, because the president gets to meet uh, gets to meet and know. Um, the officers from the various district levels, other than that, that I, of course, knew the district chairs from my experience on the executive board as the secretary, um, but I didn't know the people who were coming up through the ranks in the, in the districts or the sections. And um, you, as the president, you get to visit all of those people, um, visit with all of those people at the various district meetings and section meetings, and, and you're invited to give talks where they, they um, uh, introduce themselves to you and um, you really get to see the full range of people who are involved at the various levels of ACOG. You also um, get to interact with committee chairs and uh, attend uh, some of the committee meetings that maybe are dealing with very hot or difficult topics at the time. And so um, you, you get a, a much fuller, as president, I think you get a much fuller view of, of the organization uh, in terms of the, the uh, membership who are really doing the work and really in, involved. And, and you also get to meet some of the international uh, colleagues and that type of thing. If I were a young medical student mm -hmm. uh, thinking about going into OBGYN uh, as my residency, and I came to talk to you because you're an esteemed member of our faculty. What would you say to them? Why would you, how would you recommend to them? I would recommend that they get involved. And people find it very difficult to figure out how to get involved. But what they have to do is to identify a senior mentor who is involved. And those people can often help introduce you uh, to the organization and uh, help you to get involved. I think they also have to realize that um, they, it, there's a commitment of work to be done, 
uh, for ACOG, and ACOG has really greatly, greatly benefited from an enormous amount of volunteerism on the part of our members, attending committees and uh, doing work, writing documents, uh, reviewing documents, and that type of thing. And, um, and so we always need people to help us. They just need to sort of figure out how to sort of get themselves into the system at some level and then uh, start to contribute. Having your vast experience from the start to the finish and up to now, where do you see the future of our specialty? What are the major aspects we need to start looking at? Hmm. Well, that's a, that's a little more difficult question because it's easy for me to talk about what I did or what happened to me. Um, I think that uh, for, certainly from my perspective of the areas that interest me from genetics, I think that genetics is insinuating itself more and more and more into obstetrical practice where a whole portion, early portion of prenatal care is almost uh, becoming focused on, on genetic uh, screening and testing and that type of thing. And I think that's only going to become greater uh, as it expands to the other subspecialties as we uh, learn more about the genetic basis of uh, diseases or the genetic influence on treatment of other diseases. And uh, I think, you know, 10 plus years ago, I predicted in my presidential address that this would become uh, a very important part of uh, practice. And I see that happening now, um, but not even to the extent in, in which it will happen in the future. I think, I think that uh, someday we'll look back as we, as you and I could look back on the Civil War and say, you know, if somebody got shot in the leg, the only uh, remedy they had was uh, amputation. I think uh, we're going to look back. People will look back and say, you realize what that when women had fibroid tumors of the uterus, they just like removed the uterus. And uh, I think that uh, surgical interventions have. Um, reduce significantly and will continue to reduce as we come up with a better understanding of what causes diseases and how maybe to avoid them or ameliorate them with non-surgical therapy. And of course, non-invasive approaches have uh, by and large replaced uh, open surgery already. And I think we'll, that will continue. So I think the surgical aspects of our specialty will change very appreciably. One of the interesting things about genetics now is the discussion about the ability to enter into the uterus and into the embryo yeah. and alter genetic defects. Do yeah. you see that as a reality or is that just thinking? Yeah, no, I think that ultimately there will be uh, genetic uh, alteration and treatment that uh, obviously has to be done at a very, very early stage of development to be effective, maybe exclusively in the uh, in vitro fertilization laboratory when that's done, but people are already talking about uh, you know, mitochondrial diseases and the like. And, um, I, and I think there will be, as we learn more and more about um, what causes, say, Down syndrome, what causes the features of Down syndrome and can pinpoint the uh, extra dosage of the genes that are important in terms of causing some of the adverse uh, aspects. Uh, I think there will become ways to sort of modify those genes, um, but they, that will have to be done before uh, full development occurs and obviously it, if there was ever going to be a, a treatment, it's going to be done uh, probably in the IVF laboratories. Mike, I appreciate very much your willingness to come and be interviewed and to make you part of ACOG history because you're already a very significant part of ACOG history. Is there anything else you'd like to add at this time? Well, I, you know, I, I would like to just add, uh, first of all, a compliment to you for the outstanding role that you did as executive director. It was a pleasure to um, be a national officer during that time, and, um, and I was able to obtain a perspective on ACOG that I would like to mention, and that is ACOG has a, a very uh, interesting blend of uh, things. It has uh, academic people involved in terms of uh, committee work and documents, but it also has the practitioners involved, and, and it's been very important to keep all of those people uh, at the table together. 
It also, uh, in you and in subsequently in Hal, has had strong uh, medical leadership that's employed, and yet it still is a membership organization with people who are elected by the membership to, to sort of have input into how the organization runs. And uh, as you know, uh, and uh, I hope, or you would put a firm, it's a very delicate balance for the employed physicians to work with the volunteer physicians and the elected physicians. Uh, but it, it really is beautifully orchestrated by the leadership, and, uh, and that's what I think makes ACOG so effective. I would agree with you because I do think that's the advantage of being an OBGYN, because we learn we have to work together to get the ultimate outcome we want. Right, and now we're learning that we have to work with the nurse practitioners and the midwives and the family medicine people and everybody else. Right. Well, listen, I want to thank you very much for being here today. I uh, have enjoyed talking to you again so much as I enjoyed very much you as a president. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.